Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for spending time with me today. The first total solar eclipse to be seen across the continental U.S. in four decades is happening next week. The eclipse will make its way across the U.S. from the Pacific Ocean, beginning in Salem, Oregon, crossing Idaho, Wyoming, Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, Kentucky, right over Nashville, Tennessee, into Georgia and South Carolina, straight away into the Atlantic Ocean. August 21st, 2017. A day to remember and prepare for. The Palmetto State will be the last place to catch the sun's dark halo surrounding the moon. And right in the path of the total solar eclipse is Aiken, the jewel of the eclipse. So this area where the city of Aiken is actually will only experience 99.9%. .9%. That means that the All-America City will experience the eclipse much longer than most locations. For nearly two minutes, around 2.42 p.m., the moon will block the earth from the sun, turning the day dark. The sky will become twilight, the air will cool, the stars will appear. Looking at the solar eclipse straight on could do some serious damage to your eyes. So experts encourage spectators to put on these glasses or use the right viewing equipment. And it's only safe to look at the sun once it's completely covered. In fact, you should take your glasses off for that brief moment or you won't be able to fully appreciate the corona. It's a view that some people wait a lifetime to see and won't happen again until 2078. You can see the shadow coming from west to east and he says that you see it coming and then you're engulfed in it. And, and he said it's a very unique feeling to just be engulfed in that shadow and, and experience the, that brief moment of darkness. Well, News Channel 6's Stephanie Bornman did that story. She's with me right now. And Stephanie, I was just telling you, of course, you weren't born the last time right. we had a, a big eclipse like this. But I remember being a schoolgirl and, what, you know, my father was more excited about it than I was. But in class, I remember we, we made boxes mm -hmm. and, and we had these special things because we were going to look at it in the boxes. Well, you came back from doing the story right. in USC, USC Aiken, sporting these really cool little solar eclipse glasses. Right. <laughs> so. Um, so I actually talked to the director of the planetarium, and she mentioned that because we wanted to make the boxes and she's like well you know we've kind of learned from that and now they're doing sort of different like pinhole projectors and stuff and they're just giving away the or they're, they're selling them selling the, the yeah. glasses well we're going to talk more about that in just a minute we have to take a quick break but don't go anywhere this entire episode is all about the eclipse we'll be back in two minutes in less than a week, we'll experience a once in a lifetime event, a total solar eclipse that will give us about two and a half minutes of darkness next Monday afternoon. And it'll be interesting to see at different places across the country if it makes a difference whether the eclipse occurs in the morning as it will in Oregon or in the afternoon like it is here. But they're also studying how it affects microorganisms because there'll be some microorganisms on those balloons and because they'll be at a high altitude and it'll be cold and it'll be darker than it typically would be because of the eclipse. They expect to see how microorganisms are affected by the low temperature and various other um, effects of the eclipse that might be similar to if a mission was going to Mars through space. Stephanie Bornman is our reporter who has been learning all about the eclipse and I've asked her to join me today so we can learn more than what you may have been seeing on TV in her reports. And Stephanie, it's, it's really been fun to watch and as I was saying earlier, for oh, me yes. to remember like the last time that I experienced something like this. What were some of the things that interested you so much? Honestly, from like just doing my reports, I think that the coolest thing I've coolest thing I've learned is just the fact that um, we are positioned so perfectly. I mean, it is one of the amazing wonders of the universe, and we are the only planet that this could happen at. And just the fact that... We're the only planet that this could... Yes. This kind of a total solar Because trip. of how the how the moon is positioned with the Earth, like the yes. distance, and then how perfectly it positions itself in front of the sun. 
and the size of the moon is the perfect size to block the sun, the sun. just so that there's a complete halo around it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that to me is just like so amazing because if we were on any other planet, you this you wouldn't be able to see it. Well, and we're lucky where we are because we fall just outside totality. And I mean, it's just a quick car drive right. if we want to get into totality. Um, I know we're going to be positioned at different places. I personally am going to be up at Young Harris, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Um, because they're in totality and, right. I, and I have a connection there. My daughter works there, so I'm going to be so experiencing yeah. it there. But um, other things that are really neat you were talking to me about were animals and how they're going to watch what the animals do. Um, so what I've learned, too, is that I mean, it makes sense, you know, when it does go dark, she, the planetarium director said that it's going to cool down. Obviously, the sun's not going to be out, and that's sort of going to confuse the animals for that time, and I just think it's so neat. I'm so excited to see, like, and just really hear and experience what the animals are going to be doing. Gonna, we actually have that sound we can play right now from the director there. Normally, when it starts to get dark in the evening, the sun is setting as dusk approaches, the animals know instinctively to go to bed, right? They go to roost. So when it starts to get dark as the moon's covering the sun in the middle of the day, the animals think it's nighttime. So they go to roost, and some of them that chirp at night, you hear them chirping, and roosters sometimes are crowing during the eclipse because it actually does get dark enough to see some of the brightest stars and planets, and the temperature cools by about 10 degrees. So in some of the videos I've watched of eclipses, you do hear roosters crowing, or you know how sometimes at night you hear frogs chirping and you know insects chirping, things like that. We may hear something like that. We might hear roosters, and we might hear crickets and frogs in the, in the middle of the afternoon yeah. like that. I know. I'm, it's just, I'm so intrigued by the whole thing. I think it's going to be so interesting. And it, that's a fun way to get the kids involved, too, is like recording and then sending all those recordings in so that the scientists can study that and see just from, you know, the first place that goes dark, the difference in sounds and how the animals are reacting to the whole thing. Isn't that one of the things that she was saying to you that they're yes. going to be doing? Yes. It's um, a science a project. project and mm -hmm. we'll probably have that information on our website. So if people do record all that, those sounds, they can send them in and that'll be used for research. And being that this doesn't happen that often, I mean, we don't really get the chance to study what happens to animals during eclipses like this. So yeah. it's definitely awesome, an awesome way to get the kids involved. Now, do you know where you want to be? Have you already gone to the assignment desk and said, this is where I want to be? Um, I definitely want to be at Camp Gravit. Um, it's one of the best places to see the eclipse in mm -hmm. Aiken County just because of the location. So I'm definitely very excited to be there. Yeah, and I understand that they're going to have a lot of different events going mm -hmm. on that day. Oh, yeah. And um, some may be free, some may be a small charge. Mm -hmm. But um, that that's going to be a really great place to gather, a, a real family thing. Oh, absolutely. I'm also curious to see, um, I know I was talking with Micah, our meteorologist, about this. and. Everyone is going to be on their cell phones that day. And so scientists have also started thinking about, like, if the eclipse is going to maybe block or, you know, any of the cell phone signals. Stephanie, thank you for your time today. And while we're talking about science, someone who did turn science into a career is with us next. Dr. Gary Sin, the director of the Ruth Patrick Science Center over at USC Aiken, will be here after the break. So we've all got our calendars marked for August 21st, and many of us have plans for where we're going to watch the Great American Eclipse. Here's how to really understand it. The DuPont Planetarium at USC Aiken is presenting additional screenings of dark shadows Saturday, August 19th at 6, 7, 8, and 9 p.m., and on Sunday, the 20th at 8 and 9 p.m. You'll need to make reservations. This program includes stunning images, Digistar segments, hands-on activities, and an inspiring video of a total solar eclipse. You'll also learn where, when, and how to view the great American eclipse safely. I am thrilled right now to have the expert from USC Aiken's Ruth Patrick Science Center here with me, Dr. Gary Sin, to talk about the eclipse, to talk about viewing it safely, everything that we need to know before next Monday. Well, I think by now people have at least heard about the heard eclipse. Heard about it. <laughs> so if, you, if people haven't heard, I'm not sure where they have been. Yeah. So we are very excited about it. It's uh, it really a once-in-a-lifetime 
experience that people will have to view the eclipse. So kind of a rule of thumb is wherever you live, uh, once during your lifetime there's a chance for the, an eclipse coming close to you. There are eclipses regularly around planet Earth, mm -hmm. but rarely do they happen in a particular, in a particular place. So this one is also special because it's going right across the entire continental United States. Yeah, it just cuts that path from Oregon to, to Charleston. Exactly. Yeah. So they, they are saying that this one will have more people to view it than any eclipse in history just yeah. because of the population of the United States. And, and also with social media, you've seen cities who have turned this into such a destination event for months. You've That's Charleston, correct. Nashville, mm -hmm. all these other cities that have really encouraged people. Columbia, mm -hmm. Columbia has a great website about it and, and um, hotels that have been booked. That's right. Uh, and in Aiken, you've, you're, you have worked together, haven't you, with um, the city of Aiken? That's correct. So we worked with the city and then uh, partnered with Camp Gravit, so the official kind of Aiken city and USC Aiken location for eclipse viewing will be at Camp Gravit. That is going to be, I'm sure, a very busy time because Aiken schools are pushing back. They're That's starting correct. a little bit late they are. because of the eclipse. Um, I, I think that this has the potential to spark an interest in science for so many kids. That's one of the reasons it's exciting for me. So at the Ruth Patrick Science Education Center, we are all about infusing a love for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So events like this that get a lot of attention uh, do tend to create that extra interest in, in the mind and heart of a young person. Um, when, when we talk about the eclipse and viewing the eclipse, now I know now we have the, the glasses and you have brought some here. Do you mind if sure, I open go these? go right ahead. Um, one thing, if you get your glasses over at USC Aiken, just go to the planetarium mm -hmm. and you can, you can pick these up for a couple of bucks. I love on the back, it tells you the different places in South Carolina where, where you're going to have the, uh, the, sh the, the, totality, uh, the darkness, the, it, right. the totality, mm -hmm. when it's going to happen, how long it'll last, and then the glasses. And oh, you can't see a thing. Not a thing, not unless you're wow. looking at the sun. Oh, wow, I just got blinded by a spotlight because <laughs> I looked at one of the studio lights in these and it was very tiny. Interesting. Um, but I want you to show the viewers what you have. Okay, so you have those wonderful ones. My yes, wife, Mandy, they are very good. puts up with all kinds of strange things that I do related to science. So she found these online a few months ago and uh, this is what they look like. So That's kind of so great. classy. I'll be wearing these at you Camp Gravit. You will wear those. Oh, so if yes. anybody wants to come by and see these in <laughs> okay, person, Okay, can I see now how they do. compare to the others? You must just love these. You know who you remind me of? Doc Brown in Back to the Future. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. He had glasses similar to those. But he could see through them, so that was the difference. The, so, that's just fascinating. One of the things that I like to try to tell people is getting into the path of totality is very, very important. And, and here's why. When you're in the path of totality, when the moon completely covers the sun, you can actually take off these sporty glasses or, or this kind, whatever kind you have, and look directly in the direction of the sun. How will, how will we know, though, if we're wearing the glasses, how will we know when it's okay? That's a great question. When you're wearing the glasses, as soon as you can't see the sun anymore, that's when you oh, take them off. Oh, then you know. Okay. Right. So at that point, there's no light coming through. You won't be able to see anything. Take them off, and you'll be able to see the, the corona, which is the outer atmosphere of the oh, sun. Oh, the, the kind of the halo. Yes. Effect. Right. And you don't want to miss that. So people have been saying to me things like, in Augusta and Aiken, we're going to be at 99%. So 99%, that sounds pretty good. And my response to that is, if you're taking an exam, 99% is really good. However, when viewing an eclipse, 99% is not close enough. And not I have some analogies to try to get that at home. Imagine going into somebody's home that, and they're baking fresh bread, and you can smell that wonderful thing. That's close, but not as close as actually tasting that bread. Right. You want to taste it. Imagine the national championship football game. You went to Clemson's game last year. You did the tailgating, but you never went into the stadium. That's like missing totality, not going into the stadium yeah. to see. Or on a hot summer day, there's a swimming pool, you put your fingertip in it. That's kind of nice, but it's not close enough as getting into the pool. Right. So I tell people, taste the bread, 
get into the stadium, jump in the pool, <laughs> make sure you are in totality. I love, I love the analogies. And if you go to the website, um, your website is fantastic. It has just a wonderful uh, resources, lots and lots of links you can click on. And there's an explanation of why, you know, near isn't, it's That's not correct. near enough. That's mm -hmm. right. You want to get to that point. Um, so I do encourage you to take time to, you can go to our show, click on the Jenny link on WJBF.com, and we'll have all of that information there. It'll hook you right up to it. But um, the science behind it is fascinating. And also I think the idea that this is something as a country I mean, it's going to be a collective experience. It is indeed. So there are a lot of things that are going on related to the eclipse. One of them is they have, they're putting up weather balloons to take images of the eclipse all along the path of totality. So that's one thing happening. There's a, a citizen's program where people can sign up to be photographers if they know anything about astrophotography and they can take pictures of the eclipse. They're hoping to get pictures from Oregon all the way to I South Carolina. So, yeah. so that's another exciting thing. South Carolina, I've heard different reports, anywhere between one and four million extra people coming to the state of South Carolina for this eclipse event. My goodness. That, that's bigger than a lot of sporting events for sure. <laughs> that is a very big draw. Well, our conversation is going to continue with Dr. Sin right after this break, so keep it right here like a pinhole projector like this where you take a box this one's a cereal box you put a white piece of paper on the inside um, on the bottom to project onto you put foil make a hole here and a hole here and put foil over the one hole you're going to look through the other hole and then you stand with the sun to your back and you project the image of the sun through this hole and you look here and you can see the projected image of the sun and the eclipse as it's happening inside of the, of the box. I'm actually excited about getting to look at the solar corona because that is the part of the sun that I study. Uh, the corona is very hot, it's millions of degrees, and the solar surface below it is only 6,000 Kelvin. So that's like if you were walking away from a fire and it kept getting hotter, orders of magnitude hotter. We don't understand exactly what's going on, and so we're trying to understand uh, how the corona is heated. We are continuing to talk with Dr. Gary Sen, the director of the Ruth Patrick Science Center at USC Aiken. And before you leave, Dr. Sen, I, I want to ask you about some of the things that we're all seeing online. Okay. Um, one, one thing that is pretty interesting is some theories that with, within two weeks of this eclipse, earthquakes and tsunamis can be triggered. And, and um, they, you can look at different sites that that show the path and where the eclipse goes along different faults and, and how that can trigger earthquakes. What do you think about that kind of science? I don't think that there is any connection between tsunamis, earthquakes, and the eclipses. So I've not looked at the data to see if there is any connection, but uh, just intuitively, while we will see differences, darkness will occur, temperature changes will occur, uh, they're not even as dramatic as a night and day, just in the course of a normal day. So at night, we have a temperature that's much different than it is in the middle of the day, on a hot summer day. So our, our change in temperature won't be even that drastic with the eclipse. Yeah, because it'll be short. Exactly. Right. But there, there should be a temperature change, certainly a difference in uh, the amount of light around. Animals will respond. There have been many reports yeah, of that. Yeah, animals, right. And I'm actually looking forward to that. I hope that we hear some chickens doing yeah, some things doing or thing. some of the night animals coming out or some other animals going away. But uh, it will certainly have an impact, but not that level that, I'm, that you talked about at first. All right. And finally, the last thing, there's this growing rumble of conspiracy theorists and preppers. And any time there's a big eclipse like this, I mean, you're going to have the brown signs, the end is near, the end is near. What is it that is so fascinating about a, a celestial event like this? I think they are fascinating, and every, everybody, or many people, certainly uh, get some enjoyment out of participating in them and experiencing them. So some people just take it a little bit further. Uh, there are eclipses, even though this is rare for us right here in the CSRA, there are eclipses regularly somewhere on planet Earth, one a year or so. So we've been seeing them a lot. and. Yeah. You know, nothing seems to have happened so far. I, I'm expecting that if we want, we can have a conversation on the 22nd of August. And we'll still be here yeah. to talk about it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, so 
I don't know. It's up to you whether or not you go stock up on water and canned foods. <laughs> <laughs> some, of the, some of the preppers say you've got to do. I think it's going to be exciting, and I appreciate all the advice about the glasses and where we can go to see it. And again, there is absolutely no reason not to take advantage of any of this because of the great websites. So once again, you can take advantage of the shows coming up for the Dark Shadows. See mm -hmm. that before the event, and um, hopefully join the scientists and the city of Aiken over at Camp Gravit and make a big day of it. Sounds like a I know like you're looking plan. forward to I it. I am looking forward to it. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time today. Appreciate you being here, Dr. It's Sam. been my pleasure. Thank you. Certainly. Well, it is no surprise that some people out there are out to rip you off when it comes to the special eclipse glasses, these that we're talking about. The American Astronomical Society is urging buyers to be on the lookout for fake glasses that don't comply with ISO standards. These are what you want. NASA and the American Astronomical Society have a list of reputable retailers, including Lowe's. You can buy them online or in stores for as little as $1.98. These eclipse glasses are designed to protect your eyes during the event and are the equivalent of wearing 13 pairs of sunglasses, blocking out 100% of harmful ultraviolet rays. Well, that is all the time we have today. Thanks to my guests, WJBF Stephanie Bornman and Dr. Gary Sin from the Ruth Patrick Science Center in Aiken. Be sure to catch past segments on WJBF.com and like the Jenny Facebook page. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone, and I'll see you right here next Tuesday at 1230 for Jenny.